Hey, this is Vanessa. We've got a pretty big announcement at the end of this episode, so please make sure you listen through to the end. Thank you. From KCRW, this is Nocturne. I'm Freddie, 56 years young. I have my AA degree in uh, human services with a specialty in drug and alcohol counseling. We're in Echo Park. We're around Echo Park Lake on the edges of it, and we're watching all these ducks, and some people would say murky water. I just think it's beautiful in all its nature, you know, and having all this wildlife around us. Freddie and producer Carla Green are in Los Angeles, sitting at the park, watching the ducks and talking. They chose this spot so they could stay close to Freddy's tent. He doesn't like to be too far away from the tent, unless he can find someone to watch over it for him. We're more or less about a block and a half away at the most, at the most. Freddy's tent sits right at the entrance to the Sunset Boulevard overpass, on the narrow sidewalk beside Glendale Boulevard, a busy, noisy six-lane street. It's about a block away from the apartment he shared with his partner, Maria, Echo Park is only a block and a half in the other direction. Even though the park is close by, Freddy doesn't come here very often. Not as often as I should because of emotional feelings. As with Maria and I used to like to come and walk sometimes when the sun was setting, just to come and feed the ducks. Maria even named one of them Snowy. He's he's an all-white duck. And that's the reason I really don't come as often as maybe I should to remember her, respect her. It's just hard. Ever since her passing away, I've gone into uh, a depression, a deep depression, but not as deep as what Maria took me out of. I had become a recluse in my own apartment uh, after my mom passed away. She drew me out of that hole, that abyss. She died a year and a half ago, and we were together for four years. I still feel Maria around there. And I know Maria's also with me in the tent sometimes, because I, I believe in that kind of thing. I Sometimes I smell her. But I guess it's that bond right there. So that's why you stay there? Yeah. Plus, I don't want to come to the park, because there's a lot of negative elements. A lot of nocturnal negative elements. More from Nocturne in a moment. You're listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. Producer Carla Green first met Freddie when she put out a call to unhoused people for a project she was working on in L.A. Freddie volunteered to help. He'd recently had a very scary experience. He'd been living in a tent for around four months after the death of his partner. The tent was in a tunnel under the Sunset Boulevard overpass in Echo Park. One night, as he was drifting off to sleep with his two cats curled up by his side, someone driving by threw a firecracker out of their window— which blew a hole in the side of his tent and filled it with smoke. In the days after the attack, Freddie panicked when he heard the sound of car engines nearby and slept only about three hours. You tend to be more vigilant. Sometimes I'll have a good deep sleep, rarely though. And sometimes there'll be sporadic moments spread out through the night. And that, that, that can wear you down. That's an old thing on the street, and it holds true. And then nighttime, it's when all the creatures come out, and all the personalities and certain people come out. Under the overpass of the Echo Park Bridge, which actually down here is more of a tunnel, and it's very noisy. Voices echo in here a lot. Some people love to disturb Myself and, and the neighbors at nighttime, when they come out of the club and start making all kinds of noise on purpose. Yeah, people yelling in the damn tunnel. Uh, idiots in cars that like to honk their horns 
or rev up their engines. You know, it's a very high pitch, you know? And there's some individuals, I don't care who it is, whether you're homeless or not, and that like to be very rude and disrespectful to other people's property and home dwelling, but they come and slap it. Or, I've had this one, they like to literally piss right next to my tent. I, I live very close to a club. I mean, sometimes there's good people, sometimes there's stupid drunk people, and then there's people who maybe not be so drunk or high and they're just playing stupid where they like to do very immature things. Yell inside, hey, wake up. And then when they hear the voice coming out of that, that tent, it's like, oh shit. It's 1248, 12.50 in the morning. Just had some drunk girl fall over on my tent and it, she cracked one of the frame supports. Uh, we'll be okay for the meanwhile. It's just one of those things that happens when you're homeless with people who are drunk coming out of a club. Uh, my cats are fine, you know. Just having to uh, go through this kind of stuff is really not good. My biggest worry at nighttime are my cats. <laughs> I'm asleep and they're active sometimes, okay? Because cats are very nocturnal, okay? Uh, but sometimes they, they're, they're trying to get used to the cycle of when I sleep, all of a sudden they see dad's going to sleep and they'll curl up next to me. So I feel safer in that aspect, that they're safe, that they feel secure. But anything that can happen will happen, you know, and that kind of thing. If there's some idiot individual, man or woman, that's going to come and slam into my tent like it's happened before, okay? Yeah, some idiot youngster didn't see where he was running. He was drunk coming out of the club and slams right into my tent. I'm glad I was there. I'm glad that I was inside the tent where I just like pushed him straight off and he did not like that. I saw the shadow coming straight from my tent. I was just ready. I wanted to protect were my two cats, my two kids. Okay? That's what I'm there for, to be their protector. So that's what worries me the most. That's what I'm scared of. Okay? Some individual that's gonna may hurt one of my cats. At the time of this interview, Freddie had been living in his tent under the overpass for around a year and a half. He'd made it as much of a home as he could, stocking it with some clothes, a water bottle, a few books, the cat's litter box. Blankets galore in the back. It's my, my mattress, my, my way of keeping warm. That way I don't have to feel the, the concrete. Uh, concrete's pretty, pretty bad when it comes to body heat. It, it literally rob you of body heat. The most important things in the tent by far are Freddie's two cats, Salem and Stranger Trouble. Salem's a nine-year-old cat. He's just very laid back, very cool. He was already named Salem when I got him. My other one, uh, we're looking at Stranger Trouble, my female cat, a year and a half old, seeing who the hell, who's opening her, her tent. She's learned how to unzip a tent with her teeth, but I do have a way of securing it, so she, my little one won't open it. That was the last precious gift my late wife gave me. Stranger Trouble was named after Freddie's friend and Maria's brother-in-law, Frank. Frank, that was his real name. We call him Stranger in the neighborhood. It was hard not to get into trouble with Frank. When Frank said, let's go do this, best if you don't go, and if you do, hang on for the ride because you don't know where it's going to take you. I miss Frank dearly. He was taken away from us violently. He was gunned down. Frank's death was gang-related. Freddie was in a gang, too, when he was younger. My late wife, Maria. Believe it or not, she is actually one of the original homegirls of my neighborhood. Homegirl means somebody that's from your own neighborhood. A neighborhood on the streets usually refers to a gang. Like when I say, what hood you from? It just means what gang you from. Okay, simple. And I always wanted a partner in life, right? A life partner to be one of my homegirls. Because we have so much, in, we would have so much in common. I always wanted this person to be a friend, my best friend, and, and, it, and, and whatever God would throw into the mix. And he 
came through with flying colors and above that. Um, I considered Maria my, my gift from God. Even though Freddie and Maria were from the same neighborhood, they actually met through Facebook. Freddie had written about his memory of Frank in the wake of his death, and Maria wrote back to thank him. They started talking on the phone, and then after a couple of weeks, she took the bus down from Anaheim to Glendale to visit him. They had a few dates, and then after only a couple more weeks, she moved in with him. Something I mean, told me it's the right thing to do. And it was. They were never officially married, but in their eyes, they were husband and wife. I remember her words to this day. Because all I needed to hear was we don't need a paper and, and some rings to tell us that we're married. We are. Yeah. I have no regrets about our relationship. Probably the only regret, and it's not, it's not that I'm mad, it's not that I'm angry. Disappointed. It was such a short time, four years, until she passed away. That was around a year and a half ago. In the beginning, Maria moved into Freddie's apartment in Glendale. They created a home together. Freddie liked to cook for Maria and get her to try new things, even if she didn't want to. That's one thing I love about being married with Maria. I'm the one that cooked the dinner. I, I really didn't want her to. Not that I wouldn't allow it, I just didn't want her to cook because I like to watch her face eat whatever I created. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a good fulfillment. She claimed she hated mushrooms. So one day I went and bought some baby portobellas, okay? Chopped up a lot of garlic until it became like almost pasty. Garlic will do that when you chop it up very fine. Some cream cheese and mix up the garlic with the cream cheese. Maybe a little bit of dried parsley. Then I stuffed each and every portobello button there was with the cream cheese garlic mixture. Jizzled that with a nice bold tasting uh, extra virgin olive oil. Popped it in the oven until it turned a little bit golden brown. And see all the bubbly woozy uh, cheese. And then I took them out, left them there. And she goes, oh, what's this? And she popped one in her mouth. <laughs> I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. He didn't tell Maria they were mushrooms, which she claimed to hate. She loved it. She loved it. Freddie and Maria got a new apartment in Echo Park not long after she moved out to be with him. It turned out that the apartment came with a job. Freddie and Maria became the managers for their building. That apartment is the last place they lived together. It's very near to where Freddie has his tent. It's a way for him to stay close to her. Right from where my tent is, a block and three quarters, maybe 100 feet going through the tunnel. On the other side of the tunnel is exactly where Maria and I used to be managers, including the businesses that are at the bottom on the other side of the, of the tunnel, and which are attached to the building. So we had to collect rent from them too. They went on for 16 months, and during this time, on August 1st, 2018, Maria passed away. She died of a heart attack, almost in my hands, almost. She collapsed in my arms. And uh, by the time I got to St. Vincent's Hospital, which is only about six, seven blocks away, she had passed on. And believe it or not, even with, with all the negative thoughts society tells us about death, Next to love is probably the strongest entity in this world. My personal view, it's a beautiful thing, actually. People look at me like, you're twisted. No, no. If you look at it from my eyes, my point of view in this world, it's the most equal thing in this world. It has no prejudice or prejudices. Whether you're whole in body, or in mind, or if you're not, death will take you. If you're the richest man in this world, or if you're the very poorest person in this world, it's coming to take you. So how much more equal do I want it? King, okay? that's how beautiful death is. It has no preferences of anyone. It's a beautiful thing. So no, I'm not scared of death, never have been. While Freddie wasn't scared of death, Losing Maria hit him hard. 
He'd already struggled with depression, and after her death, he says he let it all go. He wasn't able to take care of his responsibilities. They'd already been in a dispute with the landlord, and it came to a head after Maria died. Things really started going down after that for me. I was evicted, I was asked to leave, and I hit the streets. Uh, luckily, I already had a tent. Somebody, I, I let them know what was happening, and they were gracious enough to buy it for me. There was a time earlier in Freddie's life when he was without a home. That was a very different time, but it did affect how he felt about losing his home this time. It didn't scare me, because way back when I was in my negative lifestyle, I made myself homeless. I left home completely, uh, a good home at that. My mom was a hard worker. She would provide so we all could have a roof over our head and food. And I was in my 20, about 25, 27. And I didn't give a damn. Gang banging and drugs. I decided just to leave home so I can go chase my, my shit. Okay? Not a very good plan, you know? If you would ask me then how, how to go for you, I would tell fuck you, <laughs> you know? I would just fuck you, man. But now it's a different ball game. I'm, I'm so clean. Uh, I'm a recovering addict. Still makes me an addict, but I, I just don't use. It's been 21 years. A lot of ups and downs. But I'm still alive. You know, I'm still alive. I lived in those abandoned apartments and, and I lived in an abandoned house with many other people. You know, many people, aren't you scared? No, I've been homeless before. Late 80s, mid to late. But that time I didn't have a tent. That time I didn't know how to go and acquire food. That time I didn't know that there were all these organizations that are willing to help out a homeless person. At that time, Freddie's drug use came before any help he might get. See, crack cocaine, as we call it, rock on the street, became my life, my wife, and my God. I had a 13-year nightmare. In 1998, Freddie finally got sober. Forcibly. <laughs> God's doing. Uh, I knew something was, hey, something was dead wrong. I knew it inside of me. I started praying, take this shit away from me, keep doing this shit. I kept praying, and I guess God finally said, you know what, keep giving me chances, and you keep asking for more chances. I'm gonna give you a big break. Yeah, he's got a big foot kick my ass, I'll tell you that much. And I mean that, and I thank him for it. I was arrested. Freddie was caught with drugs and a dirty crack pipe. Because he had the pipe, he was charged with possession, but not with dealing drugs. And they told me if it hadn't been for the dirty crack pipe I had, I would have been, for sure, I would have been given 25 to life. How ironic, how very ironic that it, what was killing me actually went and saved my butt from doing 25 to life. Although I was doing both, using and dealing. And I was dealing a lot. Freddie was sentenced to six years in prison. And you do 80% of those six years, which comes down to five years, seven months, 20 days. During that time in prison is when Freddie got clean, eventually leading him to become a drug and alcohol counselor with an apartment and a girlfriend. That was a while ago. Sometimes now he sees his former clients on Skid Row. I still remember one or two people at least to be my clients. When you're on the street, you know anything will happen and can happen. So it, it really won't surprise somebody. Um, I'm going to be very blunt about this. If you've been on the streets long enough, and even if you see a dead body, it's not going to phase you. That's a sad. That's very sad because as a human, you're supposed to be at least have a little type of shock to it. And I hate to say it, but when you're on the streets, especially in Skid Row, it just won't phase them. They see a body, or they, if they even witness a stabbing or shooting, it's just another day in the ghetto. Hard, yes, but you know what? I think it's the mind and the body's defense mechanism on how to survive. 
Because if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna start having feelings about somebody getting hurt, killed, injured, deathly sick, you're not gonna make it. You won't make it. Because then you'll be you'll be crying every damn day of your life. I don't have. I'll ask. If that doesn't work, I'm headed to downtown schedule to go get a meal somehow. Or I'll even ask somebody, can I have a dollar? I, I need to eat. If they want to give me it, fine. If they want to buy it for me, just as good. I'm not really worried about it. The one thing that I'm concerned with, usually are my two cats that come before me when it comes to food and water. I'll do without. Freddie knows many of the store owners and managers of the businesses in the neighborhood. There's the tax preparers, a bakery, a cafe. They sometimes let him use the bathroom, and he helps them out where he can. Directly next to me is a beauty salon. Uh, the owner, great guy. Great guy. Always smiling. He's rarely there, though. But when he works, he works hard. I sweep the whole sidewalk. It's a promise I made to them, and I also promised that I would... At nighttime, when they're not around, I will personally keep an eye on their place, which I do. When Freddy's done sweeping up and finding food, he heads back to his tent in the tunnel and his cats. Cars drive through frequently, pretty close to where he sleeps. There can be a fair amount of traffic. It can be extremely loud. And then all of a sudden, it's very quiet. Damn quiet. Last night, I thought, hell, man, the end of the world hit because all of a sudden, three minutes worth of pure silence. It, sounds like it, it will catch you off guard. It will definitely catch you off guard because your mind and your ears are so used to hearing traffic. Sometimes your mind will just block out the traffic. However, when all of a sudden you get two or three minutes worth of dead silence, it just slows you right off. You make yourself so in tune with your environment, you make sure you hear everything around you. If you can't see anything, listen. And sometimes on the street, we tend to find it very spooky when you hear nothing. We know it's something like really eerie with that. Very eerie to people on the streets when maybe you're walking out and you don't hear cr- not even the crickets, okay? That will spook you out a bit. It'll unnerve you. Carla's first interviews with Freddie took place before the pandemic hit. He kept recording audio diaries even when they could no longer talk in person. After the lockdown, times of quiet transformed into something even more unnerving. It's April 20th, um, 125 in the morning. Can't sleep too well right now. That's how I'm doing this recording right now. Uh, the town is very quiet. Mm. Well, given the fact that there's this virus and many people are staying away from the streets, it's hard, kind of hard to shake off. The weird feeling that when things are quiet, it's not really good. It's just kind of spooky. Not seeing people on the streets uh, like it used to be. I don't think our society will ever be the same again. The challenges of being unhoused are almost too many to count. They take on a distinct flavor at night. It's tough sometimes, whether it be day or night, but more so in the nighttime. In the nighttime, it can get damn cold, depending on what time of the year it is. Sometimes there's, there's nights very un- unlike people who do have a home where you can go to your cupboard during the nighttime if you happen to get thirsty or hungry. But guess what? Sometimes you don't have food. Freddie has struggled with insomnia for much of his life, more so during bouts of depression. When he lived in an apartment, he would often get up and cook when he couldn't sleep. That option is not available now. I smoke cigarettes, watch TV on my cell phone now, now that I know I can download TV apps. Uh, I'm mainly into comedy. I love comedy. I love action movies. I have a few books I read. The, the tunnel has lighting. I unzip the flap so I can let the light in. Or I have a very bright battery-operated lantern. It is bright. I don't even like to use it because I don't want to feel, oh, there's somebody home! You know, that kind of thing. Maybe go for a walk up, just up to the corner and back. That's about it. I don't stray away too far away from my tent. Freddie makes the tent as comfortable as he can for sleeping. Lately, the insomnia has been better, but conditions don't make for great sleep. So I lay out my blankets, make sure I have a good bedding for my back, away from the concrete, 
So I put a nice little layer of thick blankets down first, and then I have another layer on top of me. And of course, my little cat, well, my younger cat, Stranger Trouble, uh, now she's adopted a special little blanket for herself, which is on my blankets, and she likes to curl up with me. I bless my cats. It's like, I know they can't say their prayers, so I help them on that aspect. I bless them. I have a special prayer. Uh, usually, I just say thank you for the day, you know? Watch over me and my, and my kids here. And thank you for saving me from me. I, uh, I'm about to bless my youngest cat right now. So let me do that. Stranger. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I bless you. My older cat is already asleep, so I'm not going to bother him. I guess it's cold enough for for them to decide that they're just going to call it a night. Myself right now, contemplating whether to just call it a night or I'll just see what I can do so I can make some money before tomorrow. It's part of being homeless. You know, just got to go with the flow or plan just a little ahead. I, I try not to plan too much. It never really, really works out for me. I try to play things by ear most of the time. It can be very lonely sometimes. It can be very lonesome, but I'm not lonely. I'm not a lonely person. I can be alone with myself. It's all right. Freddie has found a way to survive living on the street. He tries not to dwell on what he's lost, but he still hopes for better. Living on the street, you learn to, I guess, psychologically learn to block a lot of stuff. But I like the idea and the knowledge that if I have a dwelling, a real dwelling, I can cook something up at any given moment. I can go take a shower at any given moment. Excuse my language, I can go take a damn poop at any given moment, okay? Something that people take for granted. I can watch TV at any given moment, you know? Some people think, oh, you seem happy, it looks like you're having fun. No, I'm not fucking having fun, okay? I'm not. I'm surviving. And I accept that survival. I have to accept it. I have to adapt to it. Do I like it? Maybe 1% of me does? The adventurous side of me? But other than that? No. All right, so, Freddie, can you tell me where we are right now? We're actually on the very outskirts of Skid Row. We're not actually in Skid Row, we're on the outskirts of it. We're about a block away. I live inside an apartment now. I'm no longer in a tent. And when did you move into your new place? Two months ago, June, June 5th. And... Oh, I'll tell you right now. Yeah, June 5th. And um, what has it been like over these past two months? It's different. It's very different now for me. I have to admit it. In the beginning, in the beginning, this is going to sound so weird, and I hope people don't think I'm ungrateful. I'm very grateful. I actually wanted to go back to my tent, to be honest. I heard um, somebody yesterday, as a matter of fact, told me of such a thing. A friend of theirs was homeless, and they actually got, were blessed with a, a they got a job, and they got themselves a very small apartment around here, and yet they still posted up their tent inside the living room because they couldn't get used to being in an apartment. Wow. And I understand that feeling very well. Yeah. Very well. And how, how are you feeling now? A little bit more used to it. Yeah. A little bit more used to it. Actually, my two cats really adapted way better than this cat. Yeah. <laughs> By far. And what are you giggling at? Um. As I said, I, li I live in Skid Row now. Not on it, but in it. A and it's a constant reminder of where I was and where I could be again. I've, I've heard all the prejudices against uh, homeless people, and I'm very, very strong about it. Uh, no, not all homeless people are drug addicts. Not all homeless people are alcoholics. Not all of us are criminals. 
I don't care if the person's on the on the ground. Please, please, treat a homeless person with dignity. It's a human right. I'm gonna keep fighting for the homeless. I'm gonna keep fighting for myself. And whoever's out there listening, please keep fighting for us. Thank you. You've been listening to Nocturne. I'm Vanessa Lowe. This episode was produced by myself and Carla Green. Nocturne was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. We've been distributed by KCRW and also received support from KCRW's Independent Producer Project. And with regard to that, we have some big news about Nocturne. Here it is. While we've loved partnering with KCRW, Nocturne and KCRW will be parting ways after this episode. We're incredibly grateful for all of their support and have been honored to be a part of the station, along with all the other strange and interesting shows. We'll always consider KCRW to be part of the Nocturne family. But here's what this means going forward. I've been producing these episodes monthly for the past six years, and man, do I love it. I love exploring the rich alternate universe of the night and of darkness and creating atmospheric audio stories that you can immerse yourself in. And it takes resources, which KCRW very generously provided for the last several years. I really want to keep making this show, and I plan to, if I can count on you for help. Tens of thousands of people regularly download and listen to Nocturne. I get emails and tweets and listener reviews all the time, talking about how special this show is to people and how excited they get as the release of a new episode approaches. I'm so grateful for all the messages and reviews. They really mean a lot. And if you love the show and wait expectantly for new episodes, I also need your financial support to continue. If you already contribute, thank you so much. And if you haven't yet, now is the time. We really need you. The continuing existence of Nocturne now depends on your financial support. You can go right now to nocturnepodcast.org and click support to become a regular patron on Patreon or to give a one-time contribution on PayPal. This will go to paying Nocturne's expenses, including my time crafting episodes, music licensing, web hosting, and other administrative costs such as interview transcriptions and editing software. Again, that's nocturnepodcast.org slash support. Thank you so much for your help. Finally, please stay subscribed to the Nocturne feed in your podcast player. You may be prompted to say if you want to stay subscribed, and all you should have to do is click yes. This transition should hopefully go off seamlessly. But if you notice any problems listening to the show, please let us know at hello at nocturnepodcast.org. You can also tweet us at Nocturne Podcast. That's all for now. We have a lot of great episodes planned for the coming months. Till then, be well, and thanks for listening.